In today's episode, I will be talking to Harris Rosen, who is known as the Hospitality Maverick. Harris founded the Rosen Hotels and Resorts in 1974 and is an investor and philanthropist with a big vision. He believes that there is hope in education and has spent millions of dollars in helping his local disadvantaged communities. And the passion of his commitment to give back comes through loud and clear in our conversation. It's a fascinating and fun conversation about how investing in education can transform the lives of others, how giving back is an endeavour worth committing to. Listen in to hear the rest of our conversation. Before we begin our conversation, Here is a quick shout out to the Pathologically Curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast, on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today, our guest is Harris Rosen. Hi, Harris. Hi, Judith. How are you? I'm pretty good, and you? I'm doing okay, Judith. Excellent. Well, I am looking forward to our conversation, um, but before we start, tell the listeners about you. Well, I'm just 80 years old and still working (laughs) and um i I was born um, and raised in new york city um my my dad's family came from russia Uh my mom's family came from austria and uh, the daddies came first to america and settled in new york city's uh, lower east side where so many thousands and thousands of immigrants came uh, in the early 1900s, uh, mostly from Eastern Europe and from, I, I guess, uh, Italy and Ireland. And um, mom and dad met in high school, and I was um, uh, born shortly thereafter. They got married. Um, and so I grew up uh, in the Lower East Side um, between the East River and um, the Bowery and Chinatown. Uh, It was uh, an area where so many immigrants lived. So it was um, a neighborhood that wasn't uh, especially a upper crust neighborhood, but uh, the one thing we had was uh, a wonderful variety of food. Uh, And so we all enjoyed going out uh, on Saturday and Sunday for dinner as a family. My brother was born about five years after I was. And so um, I went to school there in New York City, Um, was somehow um, admitted to Cornell University, the hospitality school, and um, and went to college uh, four years. Uh, Vietnam was heating up a little bit, so I decided to join the military, Uh, went through ROTC, And uh, as soon as I graduated, I received my second lieutenant uh, bars and then shipped overseas to Asia and then uh, transferred to uh, Germany and then back to America to start my career. And um, that's where everything started uh, when I left the Army and started work for um, uh, the Wald of Astoria. Wow, it's also it seems that you've done quite a bit since you started work. Um, And I know that you've become known as the hospitality maverick. What does that mean? Well, I suspect that um, we have done things perhaps a little bit differently than um, many of my colleagues. Uh, We are a a relatively small independent company. 
Um, we now have um, close to 7,000 rooms here in Orlando. Um, we um, don't have any debt on any of our properties. And the reason we don't is because my two granddads um, sat down with me one day and they said, Harris, um, we want to share some things with you. And I said, fine. I was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And they said, um, we, we believe that you're going to be a businessman because your two granddaddies were and that you have something very special in your genes. Um, but please don't make the mistake that we made. Um, we both borrowed money uh, to um, uh, support some of the investments we made. And then during the Depression, we lost uh, virtually everything. So I went to bed that night and uh, my mom, as she always did, tucked me and my brother in. When she tucked me in, she said, Harris, why don't you have your pajamas on? Why are you wearing your jeans? And I said, well, my two granddaddies said I had something special in my jeans. Oh. Said, no, 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 different kinds of jeans. Anyway, <laughs> that's, that was the beginning of me thinking a little bit differently about things. So as soon as we were able to, we uh, completely paid all of our debt off. And uh, during these very, very difficult times, uh, that is a blessing because we don't have any mortgage payments to make. And uh, even though it's still difficult to survive with uh, uh, no visitors coming to Orlando right now, um, we still are doing okay and hanging in there. That's brilliant. Um, I noticed that a number of your associates have been working for you for 20, 30 years, which is quite unusual. Yes, that's correct. How do you manage to keep them for that long? Well, that's, that's, that's a very good question because hospitality and restaurants um, traditionally turn over um, much, too, much too quickly. Uh, I think restaurants turn over maybe uh, every two or three or four years mm -hmm. and hospitality uh, about the same. Uh, most of our associates have been with us for... 10, 15, 20, 30, some even 40 years. Um, I, I, I suspect that the difference is that um, we're not the traditional corporation. We, we don't refer to our associates as employees. Uh, we, 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 we don't treat them um, as employees. We treat them as though they are part of the Rosen family, which they are. Um, and we have a, a wonderful profit sharing plan. We call it shares of success based on seniority. Uh, we also have probably the best healthcare uh, plan in America. Uh, our hourly associates only pay about $850 a year for health care. And the most they will pay for a hospital is $750 twice. After that, they don't pay anything. If they have generic uh, drugs, they go to a Walmart store, uh, show their Rosen identification card, and they pick up their uh, pharmaceuticals for free. Um, and, and so when you add all of the wonderful benefits that we have together with a philosophy of a family as opposed to a corporation, I, I, think, I think people really do uh, appreciate that. Uh, if you work for me for three years and you have children going to college, I will pay their tuition. If you want to go to college, I will pay your tuition. Um, and I think that also uh, helps create the kind of environment that we've had uh, over these uh, 45 years. That's absolutely amazing. What made you decide to do that? Because that's unusual, isn't it? Um, I, I, I suspect it might be a bit unusual, but um, we do a, a lot of things that are unusual. Um, we, we don't have a board of directors. We don't have shareholders. Uh, we just have uh, me um, and uh, all of our associates, uh, some of whom do have some um, interest in, in our company. Um, and, and I think that uh, we, we are not bound by uh, 
what what corporate America often is a lot of rules and regulations and and the, the hierarchy uh, in indicating exactly what you can and cannot do what's appropriate what's not appropriate we are we are guided by something that's very simple we always try to do the right thing uh, and that that we keep we keep it simple in the military um, I learned a couple of things. Um, of course, I learned a lot, but a couple of things that remain with me today, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid, um, and P-P-P, P-P-P, prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Uh, those are two things that we adhere to and, 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 and also try desperately to uh, keep our associates uh, happy. Um, during these very, very difficult times when um, uh, Corporate America uh, announces uh, furloughs without pay. We have furloughed uh, our, many of our associates, uh, but they do receive a, a very nice portion of their salary. So with that and unemployment, uh, they, they can be relatively comfortable. Do you think it's the benefits that are making people stay with you for so long? Or do you think there's something unique about what your organization does or believes in that makes them want to stay? Yeah, I, listen, I, we, we are different. I, I, when I left the military, I, I worked for some of the largest uh, hotel corporations uh, in, in America. Um, I, I, I worked for the Hilton Corporation, and um, I came here to Orlando with, with Disney. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not diminishing uh, how wonderful those organizations are, but, but there is a significant difference um, between us and them. Um, my office um, is um, in the first little motel that I bought almost 46 years ago. Uh, it is on the second floor of a two-story motel that is now approaching 47 years old. Uh, we now refer to my little office as Trump Tower Annex. <laughs> I suspect that Donald would not be very happy in the little office that I have. But I'm comfortable here, and I've been here for almost 46 years. And I think our associates uh, appreciate the fact that I'm kind of a down-to-earth person, and 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 my office is is really open um, uh, all day long for them to pop in and 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 say hello or discuss some issues with me. Um, and and so that's much different than the traditional um, hierarchy in in the corporate America. And and so I think. Our, our associates really, really appreciate the fact that they feel like they're part of a family um, as, as opposed to uh, being a part of a very large uh, bureaucratic organization. Uh, we've, we've never had an organization chart that I can remember. Um, and um, we're, we're, we're much more, I think, flexible in, in terms of how our associates can share issues with us. It certainly sounds really, really different. And I think a lot of companies talk about, you know, our employees, our family, but it sounds to me that you really are treating them like family because what you say, you know, if they've worked with you for three years, they've shown some commitment, you're sending them to college, which I know is extremely expensive in the United States to do that. Well, uh, we know how important education is. I was the first one in, in my family to, um, to go to college. And, and um, I, I know how important uh, college is. Of course, graduating from high school is, is the first hurdle to overcome. Mm. Um, but but I, I, we did the college scholarship because we, we know um, how many of our associates, um, um, particularly their children, would, would love to um, have um, uh, careers that are successful, uh, and and often a college education is is of paramount in, importance. Um, so that's why that's why we did it, and we we can do it. And and the fact that we have no mortgage payments at all uh, makes it a little bit easier for us to to be in, inclined to be a, a little bit more generous. Um, but it also enables us to do um, other things. Uh, we, about a third of our associates are from Haiti. And so we have spent many, many years uh, working in Haiti, uh, building schools, 
um, and, and rebuilding homes that were demolished by Hurricane Matthew. And our Haitian associates really appreciate that. And, and, and a, a multitude of other things to help our Haitian brothers and sisters get along. Uh, here in um, Orlando, we have adopted two underserved communities where we provide free preschool for all of the youngsters in the neighborhood and, yes, free college for all of the youngsters who are accepted to a four-year college or community college or trade school. And, and I think um, our associates really appreciate the fact that we care so much about our community. Uh, in addition, uh, about 15 years ago, we helped build what is now referred to as the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. And many of our associates' uh, children are going there on scholarship. Uh, it is now ranked one of the top three or four hospitality colleges in the world, uh, very close to Cornell, uh, which has been around for almost 100 years. Wow. And we've been around for about 15 years. So I think our associates really, really do appreciate that we care a great deal about our community. Um, the, the, the Tangible Park community and the Par Paragon um, and Paramore community are, are two communities where um, some of our associates actually live and, and are the beneficiaries of us providing uh, those wonderful benefits for their children. So these are things that, that corporate America is, is probably not able to do or, or finds difficult to do because they have so many shareholders and, and they don't want to do anything that, that is, is, is going to um, uh, create any issues with, with their shareholders. I don't have to worry about that. I just worry about um, our associates and what, uh, what I believe based on conversations with them, um, they would really like us to become involved with. I think it's totally amazing. One of the things that I say socialised mavericks are good for. So what, one of the things I say about socialised mavericks is that they love to work for the greater good. And you are demonstrating that with all the things that you've done. What has been your driver to work for the greater good? Because it's quite maverick to do that, especially in an environment that you're in where it's very cutthroat. Well, that, that's, that's a great question. And, and let me share with you something that happened many, many, many years ago mm -hmm. that, that I think um, helped create an incentive on my part to, 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 to do these things. Uh, my brother and I were walking to the library in, in um, our neighborhood. Um, and when we got close to the library, we noticed a sightseeing bus. We hadn't seen a sightseeing bus in our neighborhood ever. And we were really wondering, why would there be a sightseeing bus in our little neighborhood? Nothing really special in our neighborhood. And so we um, were near the bus, and, and uh, people were getting off. And two ladies um, got off, and we overheard the conversation. The conversation was, so this is how they live. Well, my brother and I didn't really understand that. So we went to the library, we got our books, went home, and said, Mom, a lady said something that we don't understand. She was on a sightseeing bus, Mom. And she said something about, so this is how they live. What did she mean, Mom? And Mom said, sit down. And she shared with us that not everyone lives uh, in um, a, an apartment complex uh, like we do, a tenement. And, and not everyone lives um, in, in the kind of neighborhood that we live in. And not everyone plays in the streets the way we do. Uh, and, and so, for many people, our neighborhood is a little bit different, and that's why she said what she said. Well, so when we started our uh, philanthropic initiatives uh, years ago, probably around 30 years ago, sitting at my desk, I did hear a voice that said, Harris, it's time for you to offer a helping hand to those in need and to say thank you, God, for everything that you now have. And so that's when we started the Rosen Foundation, and that's when we started adopting communities and building schools and, 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 doing, and, and working in Haiti and doing a lot of things that we do now because we are so grateful for the wonderful opportunities that we've received. And we want to say thank you, God, for um, uh, helping us so much along the way. Um, and so that's really how it all started, Judith. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you hear stories like that, but they end with the boy growing up 
becoming mega rich and living in this massive house and never sharing. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it shows that you, even from a young age, you had a very kind of different view of the world. Well, I, th I think also, Judith, a, a lot of it has to do with um, where I grew up. And, and I can certainly empathize with uh, young people who are growing up in, in neighborhoods that I would consider to be underserved. And so um, I understand that. I empathize with it. I, I was living in a neighborhood like that. And, 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 and I, I, I think that helps tremendously as opposed to someone who grows up in a middle income neighborhood or in a upper class neighborhood. That's a great advantage I think that I had. Understanding what it's like, understanding the frustrations, understanding the dreams that we have, and, 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 and perhaps on occasion, uh, believing that we will never achieve those dreams. Yeah, there's nothing worse than destroying hope in someone young. That, and that's interesting that you say that because when we are asked what what is the primary purpose of what we do in these underserved communities? We say what we're essentially doing is providing hope for individuals, for youngsters who at this moment don't really have much hope. And it's good work. I was wondering, I was just looking at your foundation, one of the foundations that you have, and I was looking at the Harris Rosen one, and you talk about trying to break the poverty cycle. How do you do that? What is the poverty cycle and how are you helping to break it? Well, that's a great question. And, and, and um, when I was growing up, mom would sit down with my brother and myself and, and she would say, boys, I, I know that you uh, enjoy playing stickball and punch ball and ring alivio in the streets, but you know, there are, there are nicer areas to play. And, and so what my hope is, she said, is that you will aspire to one day leave the neighborhood and, and, and do something um, that provides you with an opportunity to live uh, in a different environment. Um, and we listened. And she said, the way that you do that is by getting a better education. So mom was a bit of a nudge. And uh, she made sure that we sat down and did our homework before we went out to play. And... Um, Dad also, who was a sign painter at uh, one of the Hilton hotels of Waldorf Astoria, would tell us, if you guys want to do something other than paint uh, signs, then you have to get a good education. And so we worked hard. We did well in school. And um, my brother became a physician. And, and I um, worked in the hotel business. And um, mom and dad, I think, were very proud of both of us. Not surprising. You mentioned a lot about the community, and I had, I've just had a quick route round um, to understand them, because obviously living in the UK, it's, it's difficult to, to understand just the name. And I was looking at the community of, is it Tangelo Park? Yes, Tangelo Park is one, and Paramore is the other. And I was looking at the, the programme for Tangelo Park, and I, to be honest, I'm totally and utterly amazed. You've got here, uh, it's got three components, three preschool for every two, three and four year old, full college or vocational school scholarships, including tuition board, but, and all that, and a, and a family resource centre. So parents can obtain counselling and other resources to become positive role models. So. Yes. What, so what you're doing then is really taking, so you talked about the poverty cycle, but you're taking like the life cycle, aren't you, of an individual from when they're toddlers right the way through to when they become parents themselves. Exactly. And, and, and so what, what we are really doing, as you said, you hit it right on the head, we are infusing hope where there is no hope. And, 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 and it changes the neighborhood so dramatically. So we, we had... Um, a, um, a, a economist crunched some numbers for us because people would ask us, well, what, what are the benefits of what you're doing, Harris? We know it sounds good. It sounds like you're doing a nice work, but are there any benefits to society? Oh my God, Dr. Lochner created a, a whole presentation which demonstrated unequivocally how the benefits were. One, it infuses hope. 
to crime in the neighborhood after a, a relatively short period of time declines by as much as 80%, 80%. Wow. Yes, graduation rates from high school have gone from about 50% to 100%. Graduation rates from college are now at 78% in four years. Uh, these are, these are, this is data that is absolutely unbelievable, unparalleled. And then every time a youngster graduates from high school who heretofore would not, that youngster will earn about a half million dollars more over a lifetime. If that same youngster goes on to college and graduates, that youngster will earn an additional $1 million over a lifetime. Well, you multiply that by hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of young people, and the return on that investment is huge. In fact, Dr. Lochner calculated that return on investment for our Tangela Volk and Paramore program seven to one, which meant that for every dollar we've invested, society benefits with seven dollars. And so not only is this an incredible philanthropic initiative, but from a monetary and ec economic perspective, it is huge. We dream, Judith, we dream, uh, we've been doing it for 28 years, but we dream that one day in America, every single underserved community, and there are hundreds of them, will have a Tangela Park or Paramore program and will change America so dramatically that we who live here would not recognize ourselves. That's our dream, Judith. Gives me the chills. That's that's absolutely fantastic. It makes me wonder why aren't governments around the world doing something like this? Because it must be cheaper to invest the millions of dollars that you've invested in this than it is to pay for the costs of crime, low education, all those people not working and paying taxes. It must ultimately be cheaper to invest in the money while people in a cohesive program which is what you've got from you know toddlers right way through it must be cheaper why why do you think people aren't doing it you know judith that is the question we have been talking to people who represent uh, some of the wealthiest individuals in america um, who um, have large corporations who do a wonderful work um, uh, charitable work and we've asked them if they would have an interest. I won't name anyone, any of them. I don't want to embarrass them. But we have not received a positive response in 28 years from anyone. Why? We have asked ourselves that question. Why? Well, um, one of the questions we are asked when somebody is asking about a program is, Harris, uh, how long do you have to do it? Well, we used to say in perpetuity. Mm. But as soon as said that, oh, people would just walk away. Yeah. And so then we said, well, until the neighborhood transitions into a middle income or upper middle income neighborhood, um, that helped a little bit. But still, people weren't uh, interested in, in, in creating their own tangible parks or paramours. And so it is incredibly sad to say what I'm going to say. But after 28 years, of not one other individual, not one other company uh, replicating the program, despite all of the wonderful things that we demonstrate the program has accomplished, maybe it just isn't their idea. And if it's not their idea, maybe they are disinclined to get involved. Other than that, we, we've given up. We cannot figure out why because the seven to one return on investment benefits everyone. Imagine if every underserved community in America had this program and crime would be down, uh, graduation rates would in increase by, by unbelievable percentages, uh, college acceptances would improve, and, and the neighborhood would transition and something so beautiful. Here's something I didn't mention. Home values in Tangela Park have gone from about $40,000 to about $150,000. So values right there in the neighborhood improve dramatically. So it drives us crazy, Judith, not understanding why other people haven't replicated the program. Do you wonder whether it's because people just love money and there's a fear that they'll go broke in doing it? I, 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 I don't know. I, I, hope, I hope you're wrong. 
um, I, I don't really understand because whatever business you're in, mm. if you invest in our underserved communities, you're essentially of investing in yourself. I don't care if you're in the retail business. Uh, I, don't, I don't care if you're in the service business. Whatever business you're in, if this little neighborhood now, which is struggling with crime, unemployment, uh, not people, not graduating from high school, not even thinking about college, suddenly transforms into this beautiful little neighborhood where kids are graduating with great optimism from high school and going on to college and graduating and earning so much more. Where are they going to spend that money? In your little business, in your little business. And, and, that, and that, I think, is, is so incredibly important. I guess there's an opportunity with when we exit or at least when COVID-19 settles down, whether that's 18 months, two years, whenever it is, that people will turn towards organisations to do things that are similar. Maybe not at such a large scale, but one thing we are learning is that those that care for the people that work for them will be paid back because people are looking at the way that the world is ordered now and saying, this isn't right and it needs to change. I agree with you completely. Absolutely. 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 This might be a, a uh, I, I know this is going to sound a bit strange, but it could be an opportunity. And, and it is devastating uh, every, every, every community where it has uh, impacted. And, and I, I think it has brought to, to our attention the fact that um, we can do things differently. We, we can improve our society. We, we, we just have to have a, 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 little, a little more empathy for those who are struggling. And, and maybe this will help. I don't know, but maybe it will help. The great tragedy, though, is that the economic um, uh, the disaster that, that, that this um, um, brings will, will impact in, in a very significant way, in a very negative way, the funds that people have uh, for philanthropic en endeavors. That's what I'm concerned about. Mm, that is true. But maybe you'll be the maverick leader that's going to lead the way. Well, it hasn't worked for the, the, the first 28 <laughs> years. Uh, so we'll, we'll just have to hope and pray, Judith. I noticed that your passion to give hope through education it's so refreshing to hear the passion in your voice rather than just saying it. What would you say is the next thing for you? Are you going to continue by having more programmes or is there a new initiative that you're thinking about? What, what are you planning to do next? Well, yes, that's, that's a great question. And um, I, I, I suspect that we will absolutely continue doing what we're doing. Um, we, we, of course... Um, intimately involved in Tangible Park and Paramore, providing the free preschool for all of the youngsters and providing the free college uh, education. And uh, we'll continue to do that uh, forever. The Rosen Foundation will continue to do that and my children will carry on. Um, whether we adopt another neighborhood or not depends on um, uh, how we can recover from this uh, this tragedy that's afflicting the whole world, uh, but I would love to do that. Um, the, the college we have is expanding and and now is the largest hospitality college in the world, um, and we will continue to support it. And we provide more scholarships at the Rosen College than all of the other colleges at the University of Central Florida combined, and wow. so we're very proud of. That. Uh, we're very proud of that. And, and so, yes, Judith, we're going to continue doing what we can do uh, until we pass. And hopefully when we, when we are, uh, are no longer here on earth, uh, we, will, we will have uh, individuals, family members, and others who will um, uh, carry on our hopes and dreams uh, for a, a better world. That is our hope and prayer. That's brilliant. Thank you. I think that's a good place to end there. But I have really enjoyed learning about the Rosen Foundation and talking to you, Harris. Well, thank you so much, Judith. I really appreciate it. And You're welcome. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Harris as much as I enjoyed having it. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, 
then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally, if you would like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk. Mm-hmm.